Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation and welcoming back to the show, we've got John the Music Nut. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Peter. How about you? Doing well, doing well. Tonight's episode, it's a what-if show. Imagine when Bon Scott passed in 1980, when ACDC auditioned the various singers in the band, they didn't choose Brian Johnson they chose somebody else. So I thought it'd be a real interesting concept. We go through the various candidates that actually auditioned. We go through the pros and cons and imagine if they got the role and what ACDC would have sounded like with Back in Black and the rest of their catalogue. So what I might do, John, is I'll start off proceedings with one candidate and then we'll just fly through and go over the pros and cons from there. So without further ado, I'll start off with a vocalist that sang for a band called Crocus. And I'm talking about Mark Storacci. So Crocus started in 1974. You would say they're hard rock, heavy metal. Mark Storacci around the time of 1980 I think he had just joined the band and the album that he was starting to get some traction was an album called Metal Rendezvous. Several of the songs had been demoed by their first singer, who was Henry Fries, who was the original singer of the band. They recorded it in 1979 and it was released in 1980. Now, Mark Storacci, if you listen to his voice and close your eyes, sonically, tonality sounds like Bon Scott. I'll throw it to you. What are the pros and cons with Mark Storacci as the lead singer of ACDC? Imagine we're in the band room and he comes in. Let's go from there. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Pros. He does sound very much like Bon Scott. At this time, Crocus's sound was becoming more like ACDC. Before that, they were trying to be a progressive band. It didn't work. Crocus had a lot of different changes musically throughout their career. But here they were trying to replicate the ACDC sound. Mark has charisma similar to Bon Scott. He didn't quite have the personality of Bon Scott. His voice would have worked, and he had charisma, but at the same time, he wasn't going to take attention from Angus Young. Angus Young is the star of the band. When we had Bon and Angus, Bon had a strong personality, but him and Angus complemented each other. Mark I think would be able to compliment Angus on stage, not try to take any attention away from him. So, and vo- and vocally, like I mentioned, closest to Bon of s- some of the other guys we're going to talk about. Cons, he's from Switzerland. Would a Swiss man, Maltese Swiss man, would he be able to get along with the band off stage? Would there be any clashes? The thing about ACDC is they like to keep everything close to the vest. They believe in family and they believe in country. Another thing, while ACDC were not, they're, they're not really known for great lyrics, Bon Scott's lyrics were very much in the storyteller vein. I thought for that genre, he was a very good lyricist. I do not think the Crocus were ever a good lyricist. In fact, I they brought the cheese level up to about a 9.9. So lyrically, I don't think it would have worked. Whereas with Brian, it did for a short time. So, to me, there's your pros and cons. 
Yeah, well said. Um, and I agree with everything that you've said. So just going over the pro, I think out of all the candidates straight off the bat, his tone replicates Bon Scott. And I would recommend the audience to look up on YouTube um, a concert that he did a couple of years ago with some band and he sings um, Shot Down in Flames and you swear it's, it's Bon Scott, it's brilliant. Lyrically, I think Crocus were never strong and that may be the English barrier. And a lot of those European bands, there is a bit of a problem. Like our friends in Germany, the Scorpions and Accept have had that similar sort of problem. It's always a little bit of an English barrier. Social fit is very important. ACDC are a family and they're an extended family with Vander and Young. They're a second, like a second generational rock family. Now, you've got to imagine ACDC came through the School of Hard Knocks of Australian pub rock. So they've had different experiences. They would need to socially align with somebody that has that social um, sort of experience. Mark Storacci from Europe is very young, very green. I'm not sure it would have been the right social fit and how long the tenure of he would have been in the band until there would have been some fractures simply because he's from a different world. Yes. So I guess it's sort of anecdotal evidence that we've got to depend on in this sort of what is sort of situation. But um, another, th a couple of things is that I've noticed with Starachi, there's been, um, a, there's been some fractures with other bands. There was a, um, I think Crocus had a bit of a, a run-in with Twisted Sister and there's been things in the mid-80s where he was mouthing off a little bit. So he was kind of had a little bit of a Kevin DeBrow feel about him. So yes. that's another anecdotal evidence that would does that fit into the wheelhouse of ACDC? Hell no. You're very right. They are a very tight ship, very much family. I think culturally they would need somebody that comes from a similar background that has a bit more experience and has that rough and tumble of Aussie pub rock or something similar from another territory. So vocally a tick, but social fit, not so, so much. So I think that probably if we're in the audition room, we'd say, yeah, we'd, we wouldn't pick him as the uh, the singer of um, ACDC. All right. The next candidate I'm going to bring to the table is one Stevie Wright. Now, Stevie Wright was the lead singer of the Easy Beats. Absolute champion, legendary power pop garage rock band, beat band from Australia. Overseas, they were known for a hit called Friday on My Mind, which has been covered by luminaries such as David Bowie and Gary Moore. Now, Easy Beats folded up in 1969 and Stevie Wright had a bit of a solo career invested by Vander and Young. And the big hit in Australia was Evie's Part 1, 2 and 3 off the Hard Road album. Now, Stevie's had some issues with substance abuse, drugs, and there's a whole big story in regards to that. I won't go into it, but you can research it on on, um, on the internet. I'll throw it over to you. Um, this is a much more experienced campaigner. We're in the band room and Stevie Wright is coming in in 1980. I'll let, what's your assessment? Okay, pros. The success with the Easy Beats, and as a solo artist, he had a lot of hits in Australia. Wedding Ring, Heaven and Hell, Good Times, Friday on My Mind was the number one, Sorry was the number one as well. Strong front man. Um, he has that relationship with George Young, because George Young was also in Easy Beats. So, again, family. That's very important. He was a very big name in Australia, especially with the Easy Beats. Now, he's a 
very animated front man. I don't know if his voice had the grit. And later on in his career, his songs had a bit more of a almost like an R&B pub rock feel. Where and in the Easy Beats, they were like British pop with a lot of bite to it. A lot of hooks, but there was bite. Not like real heavy rock, but very catchy. I could see why they had so much success there. I don't know if his voice would have fit in. His hard partying ways would have fit in, but as you indicated, Peter, too much. The Youngs, I mean, the the band ACTC, they loved the sauce, but you never heard about them getting in trouble. You never knew of them to have detoxed. Well, I'm sorry, Malcolm Young did. In 88, he had to go into rehab, and Stevie Young took his spot. My mistake. I forgot and about Angus, that. And Angus is a teetotaler. He doesn't drink. I don't. I don't believe he was always a teetotaler, though. Yeah. Well, maybe for the majority. That time. Majority of ACDC. You read stories about him backstage having a cup of tea, which is quite, uh, quite novel to imagine. Anyway, I was. I was thinking about the Let There Be Rock movie when um, he went backstage and they gave him some oxygen and he. Washed it down with a cold beer. Now I'm going back a little ways. I'm I think I believe I remember that. And that would have been the highway to El Tor in 79. So, you know, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I I maybe back in a day and then he's you know, and then he sobered up, which is very likely. Um, but I don't know if his voice would have fit in with the band. I don't know, I don't know how he'd sound on those Bond songs. Lyrically, I'm I'm sure they would probably be able to work together. I mean, the lyrics weren't silly. weren't silly. I mean, if they were really silly, it would have jumped out at me. But I think his lack of grit and his voice, even as he got older, and a little bit with the the substance abuse, which you know he he lived to be sixty eight. He just died. He died in fifteen. So I don't know if he would have fit with them vocally okay well my take on stevie Wright is that out of all the singers that we're going to go through he had the most charisma as a front man yes. so take the vocals out of it and bond scott actually said stevie Wright was my hero i actually copied a lot of my moves off stevie Wright. okay so look at some old live footage you know, just the mannerisms with the microphone. And it's you can see where Bon has borrowed a lot. Mm-hmm. Vocally, even Stevie said, because he was, he was, he actually was offered the role, um, or he was definitely in the mix. And Stevie sort of uh, had doubts himself about his, his vocal range. And especially from, 1976 towards the um the early 80s his vocal range did diminish which was a prob- you know you could only anecdotally say that may have been a result of substance abuse yes so it would have been questionable whether he would have been able to hit the high range and have that vocal range that bond had with the uh, the various acdc songs so charisma Huge tick, front man, huge yes. tick, vocal, a question mark. Lyrically, in the same ballpark. I, th- I think both of them are street poets. Even though when you look at the Stevie Wright solo albums, Bander and Young did a lot of the heavy lifting, there's enough yes. evidence of um, Stevie Wright's lyric writing that he was in the same ballpark as a street poet social ob- observational witty mm-hmm. stories of the street culturally to a t they would fit yes, in absolutely. The, school, the school of hard knocks gone through the pub rock scene man i mean you know goes back to the history of australian rock back to the 60s so very experienced campaigner so i'm in the audition room i'm thinking close but no cigar 
And I think the big thing for me that would be the deal breaker is not vocally, but the substance abuse angle. They've just had a singer that died through um, alcoholism. Yes. Do they want to go through that again? They want Absolutely. somebody that is stress-free. And there's always mm -hmm. a question mark uh, as to Stevie Wright, whether he's going to fall off the wagon. So I don't, I mean, they've gone through something that it's extraordinarily traumatic. Now you've got to imagine ACDC were on the cusp of something mega. Highway to Hell was just about to break through and they lost Bond. They don't want to lose another singer in a, a space of a couple of years. And I don't think Stevie Wright was a sure thing. So I agree with that. close, but no cigar. There's a lot of really strong, compelling elements, but there's, to me, I think it would be the reliability and um, the longevity. I don't think Stevie Wright was meant to last. He was There are some people that are just not meant for these times. And, you know, I've seen Stevie Wright um, right at the end of his uh, career and I've seen some shows like where he's been playing in a pub and um, his pep performance has been very uh, variable. So mm. anyway, um, our number two candidate, close, but not quite there. All right. Excellent, excellent observation there with the, uh the substance abuse, and do we want to go through that again? Yeah, Excellent. absolutely. All right, well, I'm going to go to another singer who may not be as well known. I'm going to talk about Alan Fryer. Now, Alan Fryer was a singer of an Australian heavy metal band or hard rock band called Heaven that had a little bit of sort of traction in the US as a perennial support act. They had a couple of albums in the States um, or released worldwide. Very much you would say that their sound was very meat and potatoes in that ACDC wheelhouse. Now, the funny thing with Alan Fryer was he was so close to actually getting the vocal spot over Brian Johnson. So much so that the South Australian Adelaide News one night had announced that he got the role. <laughs> a bit premature I ahead of it. Mm. The person that uh, Vander and Young were actually pumping up Alan Fryer's tyres. They were really pushing it. And he actually laid down a couple of demos singing old Bon Scott's um, songs with the Vander and Young support. Needless to say, we know the rest, what happened in history. So let's go back to Alan Fryer, Heaven. Over to you. Hey, thank you, Peter. Pros, Australian, Scottish Connection. Just like the Young Brothers, who were born in Scotland. Um, he has a good voice. Their first out al the first album with Heaven, which was Twilight of Mischief, had a bit of an ACDC sound. By the time they got to album three, which was knocking on Heaven's Door, which is when I knew them, it was more commercialized, what what we call hair metal today. And they didn't even sound much like the same band as they did on the first album. But they did have that grit early on. His voice didn't really have the grit again, but he also didn't, but I mean, he was a good front man, but again, the experience wasn't really there either because I don't believe he did anything big, anything big before heaven. He would have been a lot younger than the other guys. I don't know if he would have worked out despite the fact, you know, culturally, maybe so. But, and, and how, I don't know how much he wrote lyrically with Heaven, if he was the main songwriter or anything like that. Could he have been able to do that as well? I think the lack of experience would have hurt him a little bit. 
Um, maybe they, if they wanted to go in a different direction, maybe. But ACDC weren't about that. So then it was, this is our sound, and this is who we are, and this is what we're always going to do. They never chased a trend, which is very admirable of them. They were very dependable and reliable. I don't know if Alan Fryer would have worked, despite the um, the connections he has with them being from Australia and having the Scottish heritage. Yeah. Um, wouldn't you say his voice tonality was definitely in that Bon Scott ballpark? Um, as a singer, I, I, I listened to him, and I've seen Heaven a couple of times live, and okay. to me, he is kind of in that ballpark. He's got that very, that throaty voice. Is that something that didn't sort of uh, strike didn't you? Really, no, not, not much. Like, more than Stevie Wright, but not like, I, I wasn't expecting him to sound like Mark Starocki. I mean... Yeah, I mean, well, I mean Mark, Mark is the, the closest, but I, I think right. he is kind of in that ballpark. Look, um, Heaven were just starting out, and I think the pro is if you're young, you can be moulded into what ACDC wants you to, to be. And I think there's enough evidence with that first album, which is a really solid meat and potato meat and potatoes album that yes. he could have been really good for ACDC is charismatic enough. He has the pub pedigree, even though it's limited. Yes. I think he would have been a pretty good choice. Um, whether he was ready to take that jump from going and playing at Selena's, which in front of about 800 people in Sydney to 20,000 seater stadiums in France or Europe or America for that matter, because they were really breaking through big oh, they into were. that uh, back in black. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a question mark, but I can vocally imagine him singing those songs of back in black. I can't imagine Stevie Wright singing. I, I can imagine Mark Starachi. I'm just doing a recap, yes. but I can definitely, really? I can definitely imagine Alan Fryer singing that. And um, yeah, whether he's the strongest candidate or not. So I think my conclusion is put him to the side and hold him there and we'll come back to you. Okay. So we'll bring in some more folk into the rehearsal room. I'm not going to discount him. He's a strong candidate. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, we're going for a job interview. You know, there are some that you're sort of not totally convinced 100% like, wow, I want him. You just put it to the side of the table and just say, we'll come back. So, okay. Very fair. Noddy. Noddy Holder from Slade. Very experienced campaigner. Slade were absolutely huge. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth other than number ones. Um, influenced a little bit of hair metal in uh, America through the Quiet Riot, you know, Mama, We're All Crazy Now, or uh, Come oh, On, I'm Feel the Noise. noise. Um, certainly influenced bad spelling in song titles. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But um, Noddy had that very raspy, throaty voice. Um, to folk that probably is not familiar with Noddy, uh, think of a bit of a Blackie Lawless or maybe think of a Kevin DeBrow. You'd be in that ballpark. More Kevin. But, but Noddy was very much, um, I mean, he goes back to the 60s, a very aged com campaigner. So over to you, John. Would he have okay. been a, a good fit for the band? Okay. Strengths. A lot of experience. A lot of success. Primarily in the UK. He has the gritty voice. He has the stage presence. Cons. He's too synonymous with Slade. He's a national celebrity in the UK to this day. I bet you he still can't walk into a grocery store and not be recognized by several people because that, 
even in, when Slade weren't touring as much, he was all over television in the UK. I think that he also was the, a guitar player. It would have been a little weird to see him not have a guitar on him when he already got two strong guitar players in the band. I think that with his kind of dy- – he's a very dynamic frontman. He may be too dynamic that he might clash one Angus. Just a little. The thing that really stops me from hiring him would be everyone knows him from Slate. Maybe not so much in the U.S. at this point because they wouldn't, you know, they had a small cult following here. Most people didn't know who Slade was until they hit with, when Quiet Wyatt did come on Field of Noise and then the next year Slade hit with Run, Run Away and Mile Night. I think his shadow of his experience with Slade, I think would just wouldn't be a good fit. And his voice might have been a little, I mean, his voice was raspy, but maybe a little too loud because he was almost like a Steve Marriott with his voice. It's like and a foghorn. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I don't think it would have worked, although, you know, I love Slade to death, and I think Naughty Holder is awesome, but I don't know if he would have fit in to ACDC. Yeah, I think culturally he's like a generation before ACDC, so it's like, I hate to say it, this sounds really derogatory, it's like my dad, and I don't know, it's like one generation older, and may it may not have been the right social fit, being naughty everywhere and being a television celebrity, I think that may have um, that may be a detractor on ACDC because they're very private and they just want to get yes. on with the biz. Yes. And they don't want that razzmatazz. They don't want that Hollywood aspect. But I think on the positive side, he was a complete unknown in America. He couldn't, I mean, Slade couldn't get arrested in America because they had a bit of a rough and tough image. They weren't actual pretty boys. And it was a kind of glam that America didn't take to open arms. They liked a, a little bit more of the pretty boy glam. So that's, I guess, is a, a positive. Um, from a lyric perspective, Slade were right in the wheelhouse. They wrote really good quality lyrics, quality melodies. He'd bring a lot to the, the table from a musicology point of view. Can I imagine him singing Back in Black album? I can't put my finger on it and I can't articulate it for the audience, but no. And it's just one of those things. I just, I don't hear it, but I can't articulate it. Yeah. It's just a gut feel. I, I just don't think it's quite right. And I think there was a little with Slade, it was a little bit more jointy, jaunty, a little bit more upbeat. Yes, they were. Um, and ACDC are a bit more sort of dirty, bluesy, se- you know, serious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Slade so, are a great party band. Yeah, and more pa- ACDC, but they have they have a bit. They have more. They're they're kind of a party band too, but there's they're they're deeper. Dirty they boogie, deeper. dirty yes. boogie blues, a little mm-hmm. bit more deeper in that that sort of direction. So, yes. um, again, close but no cigar. But I think, right. yeah, I think the big factor here is it's just a generation older. Um, Noddy, like even in the 80s when they made the comeback, he looked a lot older. You so know when crazy? they had that hit, when they had the Kamikaze album and Run Run Away, which was uh, came out in 84, they looked a lot older, older. So, um you need somebody that has longevity, and I'm not sure that... I mean, Noddy doesn't do the Slade thing, and they've thrown the aspect of having a reunion, and he says no. Um, he's very much got another part of his career, so I guess looking into the crystal ball, it wouldn't have had the legs that, say, Brian would have had of all some of the other candidates. So close but no cigar on my friend, I think, on that one. But there are some elements there that are very attractive, so... Then we'll put that in the filing cabinet. May I add something, though? Uh, you were saying he seemed like 
another generation. I believe him and Vaughn would have been around the same age. And Brian Johnson may have been like a year younger. Because by the time Brian joined, he was 32, 33. And I think a lot of Slade's success were when they were in their mid-20s, maybe a little bit late 20s too. So I, I think they're close in age, even though, but you're right, Nadi did look old. Yeah, I think it's a perception thing before the audience agrees with John and say, what's that Peter Kerr talking about? The same age. <laughs> perception. Yes. And perception is 99% of reality. And like it goes back to, you know, I just can't put my finger on it. I just can't imagine him singing Back in Black, that album. And mm -mm. I don't know, it, it's it's maybe it's a perception thing. But to me, I, I sort of think, uh, look, of course, Bon Scott goes back to the 60s. He was in The Valentines. He was in Fraternity. Big career. But um, for some reason, I just imagine that Noddy is even one generation before that. And they had all that success in the 70s in the UK, too. Mm. I mean, they, they were successful throughout the 70s. By, by the time the late 70s came, when uh, ACDC were coming up, Slate had already had their time. So at that time, when Rock wasn't around very long, we thought a 30-year-old man or a 32-year-old man whose career was on the way down, we were like, oh, they're an older act. Hmm. And we don't look at that. We don't never look at it like that anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, there's some interesting elements in there, but I think mm -hmm. I would say my decision's gut. It's the gut and a bit of perception. Mm -hmm. And yes. I can't exactly articulate it like the others. Right. I just don't think it's quite the right fit. Okay, John. So I'm going to talk about another singer that actually did audition for ACDC but it was a bit of a comedy of errors on his behalf, I must say, that he didn't get the role. I'm talking about an artist called Terry Slesser. So Terry Slesser was in a band called Backstreet Crawler, which actually support ACDC in the day. Now, he was auditioning with the lads, and they were recording. They were laying down the tracks. Jung rang Terry the next day and said, Terry, I'm really sorry, but um, we had a bit of a, a mishap with the, the tape machine. It didn't work out. Can you come back and we've got to do it all over again? And Terry basically said, um, no, I'm not going to go through that again. So uh, I think the response from the, the young brothers were, okay, see you later. Right. Can you imagine that? You get an opportunity to sing with ACDC and just ask to come back and retape. And um, he said, no, sorry, um, I'm not going to go through that again. So I think the young brothers thought, well, that's a sign that he wasn't committed. Right. We will park that behaviour to the side, but we will look at him from a vocal perspective and what we know. So what's your take on Terry Slesser? Okay. Positive experience with Beckett, Backstreet Crawler, and then later on Crawler when Paul Kossoff died. And he was also briefly, this is after, after ACDC chose Brian Johnson, he was in a band called Charlie, who had a hit here in the United States called It's Inevitable. Hans, indistinctive from a lot of singers at that time. He sounds more AOR. To me, he sounds like Joe Lynn Turner with a deeper timber. I don't think he would have worked. And when I listened to the Backstreet Crawlers album, to me, that sounds more like pub rock. And I don't really think of ACDC as pub rock. Backstreet Crawler, to me, sounds more like Graham Parker who's an artist I really like. Um, it has more of that feel than that gritty, grimy ACDC feel with the songs that are carried by the riffs. I don't think Terry Wilson Slesser's style of singing would have fit in 
with ACDC at that time. And what's interesting is how thing, what comes around goes around in a way. Terry Wilson Slesser is now singing in Gordy, which is where Brian Johnson was before he joined ACDC. So um, I don't think it would have worked uh, primarily because of the voice. I'm not sure if he was the strongest front man either. I think you want a guy who's got more charisma, which Bon had in spades. And I don't know if it would have quite worked. I'll keep it simple. Too slick, too pop. Yes. I've seen quite a few clips of him, and he's got a very slick presentation. So um, mismatch, square peg and a round hole, plus yes. attitude, which was confirmed. I'm still – were you aware of that audition story? I'm still trying to get over that. No. No, I didn't know that at all. Right, Maybe Let's move thinking, on. There's, oh, the, uh, <laughs> there's the resume. Let's just put it over there. Okay. Iggy Pop. I'm not going to go into the backstory of Iggy Pop. We know who he is. Over to you. He goes up on stage and he does the thing what he did on his own. And he does what he did with the Stooges. And Malcolm grabs his guitar and he lays them out. <laughs> Can you imagine? I love Iggy Pop. Crazy Iggy Pop going on stage and you got Angus doing his Chuck Berry on steroids thing. Wouldn't you can only have two maniacs on stage. Exactly. It'd be a total clusterfuck. Pardon my French, but you gotta call it as you see it. Yes. Yes. It would not it would not have worked. And furthermore, I don't think it would have worked with the audience. Because back then when we thought about rock music, there was more segregation. Guys who like punk, people who like punk, don't like punk, uh, punk bands. Yeah. Excuse me. Bands who like punk don't like hard rock. Mm. Bands who like hard rock do not like punk. You have yeah, a lot more yeah. now. Now you have a lot more diversity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I love E. But square peg and round hole, it's another. Yes. And you can't have two maniacs on stage. Culturally mm. very different. Yes. Detroit, Sydney, Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's oil and water. Um, I know Iggy came out in the last year in, or two and said, I got offered the role. I don't know if I believe it. I don't know. It, it, just, it sounds really odd. Um, it does. The youngs, the youngs are very shrewd. In the, uh, I just think that's just such a wild card. It's like playing poker and you get the Joker or something. It's just bizarre. But uh, look, he he is a dynamic, charismatic front man. He's a maniac, totally. and he's inspired so many main, you know, front men. So yes. many maniac front men, and he'd be climbing the marshals stacks and swing off the, the lighting rig. You only Angus is, you know, you can't take the focus off Angus. That's right. Bon had a little bit of a counterpoint. He was kind of up there, but he mm -hmm. wasn't what you would call a maniac. He was in right. control and the eyes are on two. You can't have the eyes on, you know, Two maniacs. It, it's just two too maniacs, much of a sensory exactly. overload. So it would not work. Um, yes, uh, and again, it was the the fact that he just so crazy. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you're you're taking the star, you're taking the shine away from the star, and the the focal point of the band was Angus. You needed yep. a guy to compliment him, not a guy that was trying to surpass him, and whether. Iggy thought he would try to or not. That's just his style. Yeah, absolutely. Flash. Well, there you go, folks. We've taken about 45 to 50 minutes and we come to the, the point. But um, all of these uh, singers have their strong points, tonality, culturally, 
socially um, charismatic, you know, as, as being front people. But at the end of the day, I think Brian Johnson was a good fit. Absolutely. And I think that I, there was something spiritually in Brian from Bond when he was writing the lyrics to that album, because Mm. you see those lyrics. How many of those lyrics do you say Bond could have wrote that? That Well, I think actually Bond did. And there's been a lot of conjecture that Mm. on Back in Black, um, that he actually did write the lyrics because there was a lot of experiences that Bond had in that last tour of America. Mm -hmm. There are little references that actually popped up in the, uh, the lyrics of Back in Black. And there was a whole book, which I will put on display, called mm-hmm. Highway to Hell, that actually um, asked the question, did Bon Scott actually write the lyrics to Back in Black? And interesting enough that um, Brian Johnson was relieved of lyric duties. So why? So you had Back in Black and then, you know, very not too deep into the discography of the second phase of ACDC, uh, he wasn't writing lyrics anymore. So it raises a lot of questions. I can't see much of a difference between... Um, I, I think there's a lot of bond in spirit in Back and Black that I personal belief, I think he actually did write a lot of the lyrics. Yeah, let me catch your cake with my knife. That's a Bond Scott lyric from uh, Let Me Put My Love Into You. Some of the lyrics on Shoot to Thrill, Hell's Bells, I mean, the things that he's singing, Brian's singing about. You Shook Me All Night Long, references to um, girlfriends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, American Fies. American Fies, there, there's, right? there's, there's a lot of references that were sort of experience uh, sort of references that bond um had with friends girlfriends that he had on the road in that last tour of america so it seems to be a bit more of more than a coincidence but that's a whole uh, another show john as usual you bring home the bacon that was really wonderful i'm I'm glad that i assigned you this task and it's kind of rewarding but um as i said all of these um, singers mighty fine, but um, I think the, the the singer that they got in the end did a damn good job. So Brian Johnson, they tip my hat. You can see John the Music Nut on the Contrarians. You can see him on My Music Corner. Um, please like and subscribe to Rock Day Dream Nation. Click the bell. Um, one thing's for sure that there are going to be plenty of more shows like this in 2024. Um, Thank you to everybody. That's been the second year of Rock Day Dream Nation, and we're still going strong, and we will still keep on going in 2024. So just look out for the content. See you later, John, and talk to you soon. Cheers. Nice boys. Don't play rock and roll. Cheers.